I am privileged to be contributing to your seminar today and to be speaking on the subject of Employers for Carers, the British experience. Combining work and care is already a major economic and social issue and one which demographic and economic forces will drive even higher on the agenda. I will set out the current and future context, the business response in terms of policy and practice, use my former company as a mini case study, and then share my thoughts on Employers for Carers, the organisation I am proud to chair, and to my knowledge the only self-financing, sustainable employer-led forum dedicated to supporting carers in the world. While my references are all from the UK, I know the context and response should apply broadly to Finland, if not more so. Now you might ask what gives me the permission to speak on this subject. Firstly and importantly, I have been a working carer. In my professional capacity, I was the Managing Director of British Gas for several years, until the end of 2015. The UK's largest energy and related services provider, with 30,000 employees, including 12,000 technical engineers. I still chair one of their subsidiary companies, and British Gas were founder members of Employers for Carers. Let me start by setting out the current context for working carers in the UK. I apologise if these figures are known to some of you, but they are central to what follows. Right now, over three million people combine work with caring for older, disabled or seriously ill loved ones. Carers make up around 12 to 13 per cent of the total UK workforce, at least one in nine employees in any workplace. That fact alone, taken from the national 2011 census, should be the spark to engage employers. Eight out of ten carers are of working age, with the peak between age 50 and 64, where that ratio moves to one in five. And these are usually the most experienced people in any business. Many aged 40 to 50 are also sandwich carers, looking after both young and old. This population is not constant. In a typical year, around 2 million people either become carers or cease to be carers, with one in six of those giving up work entirely or cutting back their hours to care. And an estimated 2.3 million carers in the UK have left work altogether to care. I have taken a few minutes to lay out the problem. So why should business take the lead in providing a solution? The answer is not corporate philanthropy. It is rooted in hard-nosed, good business sense and economic advantage. The key to this business case is the failure to retain experienced employees, combined with an impaired ability to recruit and return carers into the workplace. Two recent studies demonstrated that the direct cost to an employer of losing a working carer is between 100 and 150 per cent of their annual salary. Grossed up across the UK, this amounts to a cost of around £1.3 billion a year to the economy. And when lost tax revenue and additional benefits payments are taken into account, this rises to a staggering £5.3 billion a year. The economic case for working carers across UK PLC is utterly compelling. Within the individual company, the benefits of addressing the challenge can be converted into an opportunity. An EFC survey in 2013 across 200 employers active in supporting working carers demonstrated tangible benefits in multiple areas. 92% saw better staff retention, 88% lower absence, 61% improve recruitment, 69% higher productivity, 72% improved customer satisfaction and repeat purchases. All of this converts to hard cash and improved competitiveness and bottom line performance. While I do not want to overplay my role, I visibly championed workplace carers from the C-suite and made the case to my colleagues. It boosted momentum but I was very conscious to ensure it was sustainable through building embedded policies, practice and creating a wider group of business leaders. And I'm delighted it is still flourishing even though I have retired. British Gas now sees this as the flagship among its wider inclusion and diversity agenda, the social media networks for which are joining together through Yammer. One aspect I wanted to highlight has been the importance of internal communications, 
and encourage participation of carers, colleagues and line managers. Profiling role models and celebrating the company's successes in various external awards for best practice, most recently for championing an ageing workforce. All of this mutually reinforces momentum and is raising awareness for those who are not carers today but may well become carers tomorrow. I want to turn in my last section to Employers for Carers, in shorthand EFC, and I will start with its origins. A government survey in 2000 on work-life balance had identified the scale of working carer issues. Building on that, in 2002, the European Social Fund set up a research programme on action for carers in employment, which in total was £16 million over five years of which £2 million was channelled through Carers UK into what became EFC. This focus on carers in employment was a breakthrough first. As part of this programme, Madeline Starr from Carers UK spent a large part of 2004 recruiting an interest group of pioneering employers, including British Gas, who were starting to recognise the significance of this emerging issue and committed to developing and communicating best policy and practice in this area. From day one, this was a business-led group focused on the business benefits of addressing their agenda while recognising the wider social policies. Five years on, in 2009, EFC was formally launched as an employer membership forum with the members of the original interest group developing into the EFC leadership group which still exists today. EFC is a unique partnership between business and a national carers organisation, as far as I know. So what were the critical ingredients in launching EFC? And I do believe you can use these learnings to take less than the five years it took us. Firstly, a critical mass of employer organisations from a relatively broad constituency, large, small, different sectors, public and private. Without that, EFC could not have been a representative voice, though to be honest, on day one, it was thin on small businesses and quite a few sectors. Secondly, it set out to be self-financing through annual fees, making it genuinely a business voice independent of government. Today, the annual fee is a sliding scale based on the number of employees with a typical 100 employee organisation paying £500 and one with 10,000 paying £3,000 or £2,000 in the public sector. In the early days, the business case was something of an act of faith, but it is continually being updated and in Finland you can take confidence from the UK example. Thirdly, it had a passionate champion from the business community in Caroline Walters, a senior HR professional in British Telecom and the chair of EFC until 2013. Fourthly, EFC was a collaborative partnership with and developed within and managed by Carers UK, which in turn kept it connected to wider carers issues, research and information. Carers UK to this day provide the day-to-day -day EFC resource, initially through one FTE member of staff and currently through two and a half people paid for by EFC's members. Finally, in 2010, EFC agreed a key memorandum of understanding with all seven government departments who touch on the working carers agenda. This established EFC as a representative employer group with whom the government would engage on carer policy. In its first five years, EFC grew to over 60 members and worked with leading academics. It developed its own public website as a repository for all forms of best practice. It created training programmes for line managers in understanding and supporting carers. It facilitated the creation of a UK-wide network of carers networks. And it conducted waves of research to underpin the business case and inform and influence policy makers, including the government. As chair for the last three and a half years, I've built on this strong foundation and tried to widen the membership to represent all sectors of the UK economy. We now have 110 members representing over one and a quarter million employees 
and at least 140,000 working carers using the one in nine ratio. Virtually all industry sectors are now represented. We have public and private sector members, and I'm delighted to say a growing number of small businesses through an innovative umbrella scheme. These enterprises understandably find it harder to offer carer-friendly policies and indeed to spend the time talking to other businesses directly or through EFC. The paradox is that their business case is far more compelling than for a larger employer due to the impact of losing one key employee from, say, 20. EFC have built a brand identity. We've created a digital members portal. We're actively engaged in developing government policy. And our members willingly share best practice in a non-competitive way, even within the same sector. And with Carers Scotland and the Scottish Government, we have developed Carers Positive, a recognition scheme and standard for best practice which is being rolled out in Scotland, with 64 companies recognised so far. One other development of note is that working carers are still largely seen as a human resources problem, and I use the word deliberately. I've used my personal network, the British gas supply chain, and existing EFC members to reach out to the so-called C-suite, senior corporate leaders who might see and embrace working carers as an opportunity. An excellent example of this would be Justin King, the former chief executive of Sainsbury's, the UK's second largest retailer with over 150,000 employees, who are now at the forefront of much working carers' best practice. Engaging the C-suite is work in progress, but it is building momentum. It creates several positive dynamics. CEO pull is more powerful than HR push and the two need to work in partnership. Visible championship from the boardroom drives adoption of best practice, and policymakers and government are more willing to listen to a concerted business-led group. Businesses have taken a lead on this in the UK, on the basis that, at least in this sense, the UK is not an island. Could you do the same in Finland? I wish you all the best for a very successful and productive seminar today. Thank you.